So this is Mike Billington. I'm with the Executive Intelligence Review and the Schiller Institute and the LaRouche Organization. I'm speaking here with Dr. Justin Yifun Lin, who was the Chief Economist and Senior Vice President at the World Bank from 2008 to 2012, and is now the Dean at uh, several institutes at, at Peking University, the Dean of the Institute for New Structural Economics, and the Dean at the Institute for South-South Cooperation and Development, as well as a professor and honorary Dean at the National School of Development. Would you like to add anything to that brief introduction, Dr. Lin? Well, I think that's sufficient. Okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity to have this conversation with you. Okay, very good. So, um, as you probably know, I sent you some of this. There are several senior diplomats and intelligence professionals in the United States, including Ambassador Chaz Freeman, who has great experience in China, and uh, former CIA official Graham uh, Fuller, who have warned that the US foreign policy has been weaponized and that uh, diplomacy has been lost, and that this is driving the danger of war between the US and China, as well as with Russia, uh, you have argued in the past uh, what could be called economic deterrence, that as China's economy becomes significantly larger than that of the US, that the, as you put it, the United States owned development could then not ignore the opportunities brought by the Chinese market, and that this would bring about a peaceful and common development between China and the United States. What, what is in your mind, what is preventing that peaceful and uh, common development now? Well, thank you very much for this very important questions for our world today. Because first we need to understand the cooperation between the US and China is crucial for addressing many global challenges because US is the largest and the most stronger, strongest country in the world. And China is the second largest economy in terms of economic size. And uh, their cooperation will be the foundation for alteration like climate change, like you know, to contain the pandemic and uh, like to help the other country to get you know, rid of the uh, poverty in order to achieve the sustainable development goals by the time of 2030. So the cooperation is important and a cooperation certainly is good for the US and for China and for the whole world, but we did not see the cooperation to come around. And we see a lot of tensions in the recent years. I think it's because of the US you know, lose confidence of Herself. U.S. is the largest economy in the world throughout the 20th century. But in terms of purchasing power parity management, China overtook U.S. in 2014. And the U.S., you know, for her own interest, tried to maintain its dominance economically, politically, and so on. And so now there are some you know, strategy in the US to try to contain China. And certainly those kind of strategy reflect in US you know, diplomatic foreign relations policy with China. And, and certainly that will be threatening the stability of the world because first we need to have cooperation to address those kind of global issues. But because of those kind of tension, is threat the foundation for cooperation. And that will you know, add to the uncertainty of the world, not only without addressing the challenging issue, it, add to, it adds to the uncertainty of the world. That's very bad. But I think that, uh, you know, how can we improve that? Well, one way is that China reduce the economic size. If China cut our per GDP half, then the U.S. will now feel threatened, but it's not possible because development 
is the human right. That is in the UN constitutions. And that is a constitution has been advocated by the US and many other advanced countries for century. So there's no reason why China need to, you know, cut our incomes by half or even more to please the US. <laughs> and the other way around certainly is to continue to have the development, to have the growth. And uh, I wrote in one article arguing that if China can reach the per capita GDP of half of the US, I think it's very moderate, only half of the US, I think the US will you know, accept China by that time for three reasons. If the per capita GDP in China is half of the US, and uh, certainly we have some kind of internal differences, our more developed regions like the major cities, Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, and the more developed area, our coastal provinces like the Shandong, Jiangsu, Zhejiang, Fujian, and Guangdong, their combined population is a little bit more than 400 million population. Currently, US population is around 340 million, but certainly US population will continue to grow. And I think that those more developed regions in China, their per capita GDP will be about the same as the US per capita GDP. And their economic size will be about the same as the US economic size. But we know per capita GDP means the average labor productivity of that part of the economy. And the average labor productivity certainly is you know, reflecting the, the, the industrial achievement, technological achievement. So by that time, US will not have the technological superiority that they can use to chalk up the Chinese development. Currently, you see the US put a lot of high-tech companies in China on the so-called entity list without actually concrete evidence for their accusation. And that is only because US want to use their technological you know, superiority to chalk up China's development. By the time, if you know, the more advanced region in China had the same income label, it means the same technological label, US will not be able to do that. Yes. Secondly, secondly, you know, our population size is about four times of the US. If our per capita GDP is half of the US, that means what? China's economic size will be twice as large as the US. No matter how unhappy the US is, US cannot change that fact. It's a fact. And a third, China is the largest economy by that time and China will continue to grow. And, and, and for the US, for example, those you know, Fortune 500 companies, if they want to stay on that 500 companies list, they cannot lose Chinese market. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, trade certainly is win-win, but we know that you know, the smaller economy gains more than the larger economy. By that time, China's economy will be twice as large as the US and uh, trade with China, US will get more. So for that, certainly, if US politicians really care about their own people, then to have a friendly relation with China would be, necess would be uh, you know, necessary for the US to improve the well-being of their own people and to maintain their you know, leadership, their company's leadership in the world. Right. You, you actually argued once before that, uh, that the US intentionally suppressed the Japanese economy in the right. 1980s and 90s to, as you said, to prevent them from threatening the US economic status. And that they're, as you've just said, they're doing pretty much the same thing now towards China, having suppressed right. these Chinese companies with accusations uh, and so forth. Um, how has China countered this today? Uh, you've already said what you propose 
will come in the future. But how 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 can China counter this attack on Huawei and and other companies today? I think the first thing we need to remain open. We need to remain, you know, move our economy to further, you know, uh, improve the market efficiency. I think that because certainly U.S. today has some superiority, upper hand in certain technologies, but U.S. is not the only country to have those kind of technologies. You know, like the advanced country in Europe, Germany, France, Italy, and Japan and uh, Korea, they also have many, you know, advanced technologies. And uh, China should re, re, you know, remain open, you know, to access to the technology from other advanced country, as long as it's not the technology U.S. is the monopoly. And uh, by that way, you know, you, you know that the advanced technology rely on heavy R&D. It's very expensive. Once they get those kind of technological breakthrough, how profitable for the companies depends on how large the market. And a major by purchasing power parity, China is the largest market in the world already. And in China since 2008, every year contributed about 30% to the global market expansion. So as long as China can open a Chinese market, I think that other high-tech companies will be very delighted to fill in the you know, gap that due to the US restrict its company to export those kind of technologies to China. And China only need to focus on a few technology which US is the only supplier in the world. And, right. uh, and, and by that, you know, we will not be choked off. And secondly, certainly we need to, you know, continue to develop our economies so we can go currently, if you measure by purchasing power parity, our per capita GDP is about 25% of the US and uh, by, market exchange, by market exchange rate, now per capita GDP, is about one sixth of the US. And, and as long as I said that we can maintain the growth momentum, I think the dilemma will be addressed. So you have, you've written for years about the fact that the advanced industrial nations reached the point they are at today by using uh, government directed credit and what you call industrial policy to protect and support emerging industries and the research that's uh, necessary for that kind of development. But that now these advanced sector company, uh, countries are denying the same measures to today's emerging economies under the demand of free trade. The Korean economist Chang Ho Jun called this kicking away the ladder. Lyndon LaRouche has pointed to this as the primary difference between the British system of free trade and the original American system of protection and directed credit. And I have also written that the Chinese economic model today that you promote is closer to the American system with people like Alexander Hamilton and Friedrich List and Henry Carey than is now practiced in the US itself. How do you, how do you see this? I fully agree with your questions. Actually, not only U.S. protected uh, uh, her own industry during up the catching up stage, Britain practiced the same. Before the 17th century, Britain was on the process to catch up Netherlands because at that time, Netherlands in the war textile sectors was more advanced than Britain. And a particular GDP in Netherlands uh, was about you know 30% higher than the Pocata GDP in Britain. Britain adopts similar strategies to protect its own you know war textile industries and uh, create all kinds of incentive to smuggle the equipment from Netherlands to the Britain and uh, provide incentive to attract the you know craftsmen in war textile sectors in Netherlands to Britain. 
So exactly the same, like what you know, uh, the Hamilton argues or or List argues, and uh, Britain only turned to the free trade after the Industrial Revolution. Britain was the most advanced country in the whole world, and their industry was much uh, were most advanced in the world. They want to export their product to other countries, so they started to advocate free trade. And at that time, the US wanted to catch up. And so US used exactly the same policy as Britain used in the 17th century when Britain wanted to catch up the Netherlands. And, and, and so if you look in the history, only a few countries were able to industrialize and to catch up. And you can see in the catching up process, they all use the government active facilitation to you know, support the industrial upgrading and so on. And not only so, actually the advanced country, Britain and the US, even they became the most advanced country. On the one hand, they argue free trade for their industries. But at the same time, they also actively support the research and development to further improve their technology. And so they can, you know, continue to upgrade their technology and also to develop new higher value industries by IND because at the time their technology were on the global frontiers. And if they want to have new technology, they will have to invent the technology by themselves. And the invention of technologies you know, has two parts. One is basic research, the other one the development of new technology, new product. Firms certainly have incentive to develop new technology and new products because if they are successful, they can get a patents. Uh, and then they can have a monopoly for you know, up to 17 or 20 years in a global market. But at the same time, if they do not have better basic research, then it would be very difficult or even impossible for them to have the development of new product and a new, new technologies. But you know, the basic research, the result, the finding is a public good. And so the private sectors do not have the incentive to do basic research. And so if you look into the high income country, they all support the basic research. And that is a necessity for them to continue to have a new stream of technology, new stream of products and so on. So exactly they are still doing the industrial policy, but the difference is that they are on the global frontiers. And so the type of industrial policy to address market values will be different from the type of industrial policy uh, uh, to address the market values in a developing country. So in nature is the same. But actually, the areas that the government required to put the effort would be different. So recently, there's a very famous book called The Entrepreneurial State by uh, uh, Machu Cato. And he documented all the major you know, competitive industry in the US today were the result of the government active support in the, in the basic research in the previous decade. So exactly the same. So just the area that a country require the government to put an effort will be different, depends on the state of development. And you know that in the US, there are two traditions. One tradition is Hamilton tradition to argue the government should provide support to overcome the barrier for further development. And the other tradition is you know, Jefferson tradition to say the government should do nothing. We should you know, adopt a market function. The government should be liminal, minimal. But in fact, in the practice, in the US, since the funding of the nation has been followed in Hamilton, but rhetorically following the Jefferson tradition. And so you have a split between the reality and your rhetoric. But unfortunately, your rhetoric has been so powerful. And so all the developing country, they are advised not to do anything by their government. And as a result, except for a few 
countries. Their government follow the Hamilton tradition and to be able to industrialize and catch up. And other country, they were misguided by the Jefferson tradition without doing anything. And so they were unable to narrow the gap with the other one's country. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So you and other Chinese officials, including uh, Premier Li Keqiang, have called for a new means of accounting the strength of nations, arguing that looking only at the GDP and the debt, which are the money side, is what you called severely flawed for considering only monetary data and leaving out the underlying national assets, including human capital, natural capital, and produced capital. You call this alternative method wealth accounting. So how far has this idea been developed and put in use in China or anywhere else? I first, I'm delighted to see an increasing recognition for the national, you know, the change in the national accounting. Because GDP is a flow contract, how much you produce every year. But the production every year depends on the stock of the wealth, including the human capital, natural resources, uh, 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 biodiversity, and as well as the produced capitals, the equipment, the and and uh, uh, the, the you know the machinery, the equipment, and also the infrastructure. All those are the wealth of the nation and the foundation for producing goods and service to generate the GDP. But in the past, we only look at the flow concept, the GDP, without paying condition, you know, condition to the foundation to generate the flow. And the foundation should be based on the wealth, the asset we just described. And I'm delighted to see now increasingly, there was a recognition of a necessity to change the concept, including like IMF recently, you know, produced a paper to say, you know, if the government you know, use the debt to finance the investment in infrastructure, it generate asset. And, uh, and, 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 and it will be different from the government use the debt to finance consumption, you know, and, and those are pure debt. And so if we calculate net debt, if the government use the debt to support the infrastructure or other improvement in, in the human capital and so on, then you know, it will contribute to the ability for the nation to generate new stream of income. And they will enhance the ability to pay back the debt. But in the past, when we talk about the debt sustainability framework, the, you know, the framework only uh, calculate the, the, the gross debt without paying to the asset side. And the IMF today call for a uh, revise in its you know, debt sustainability framework. So we are delighted to see now this new, uh, this more inclusive concept has been increasingly recognized and put into the policy evaluation. Were you and other Chinese economists uh, involved in that change at the IMF? I think that uh, when I was at the World Bank, I started to advocate that. I wrote, I wrote policy notes to advocate that. And but yeah. you know, to change people's you know, belief or people's ways of behaving certainly takes time. And so I was the chief economist of World Bank from 2008 and 12. And the, the IMF change is you know, proposed to change the new framework only after about four years after I left. And, and so I think that if we want to change the world, conversation like you and me, and the people with a you know, better concept of the idea should, you know, not, should, should not stop advocating that. And uh, that more people understand. And then, you know, I think that gradually, and at the end, I'm sure the world will change for better. Yes, I was going to ask anyway that you you are uh, you are attacking uh, uh, the uh, a, uh, neoliberal orthodoxy. 
But while you were at the World Bank between 2008 and 2012, you were face to face with that as the dominant ideology at the World Bank and the IMF. So I guess you're explaining now how you dealt with it then and how it's having a longer term effect of your arguments. Does that sound right? Yeah, that's very true. For example, when I first arrived at the World Bank, I started to say to advocate structural transformation is the foundation for you know, inclusive and sustainable development in any country. But yeah. if you look into the infrastructure, uh, the structural transformations, there was there are so many market values there, because you not only need to rely on the entrepreneur, uh, uh, you know, to have the innovations, but entrepreneurs, if they want to be successful, you need to provide adequate infrastructure, you need to provide adequate financial you know, support. And so you need to have improvement in infrastructure, improvement in the financial you know, structure, uh, institution, and so on, certainly also legal institution. And for all those things, the individual enterprises, they will not be able to deal with. Right. Uh, you need to require the state to do it. But state's capacity and resources are limited. And so you need to use your limited capacity and resources strategically. And then that means you need to pick certain areas that you want to do and so on. And those certainly is so-called industrial policy. At the beginning, you know, industrial policy was a taboo in international development organizations, including World Bank. But I started to advocate that. I'm delighted to see increasingly you know, people accept it's necessary to have industrial policy, including the US government now openly say, we embrace industrial policy for our further development, right? And for example, infrastructure. In 2009, I started to advocate to uh, invest in infrastructure on the one hand to cope with the counter cyclical intervention, the necessity for counter cyclical intervention, but at the same time to pay the foundation for long term development in the developing world. So it's a major one storm killing two birds. At the beginning, people were also very reluctant. At that time, the counter cyclical uh, intervention mostly are in provide, providing rescue package to lay off workers and so on. And uh, I see certainly to stabilize the economy will be essential. But if you only provide, let's say, you know, uh, the unemployment benefit, you support the consumption, yes, but you do not contribute to enhancing the you know, growth potential in the future. And if you invest in infrastructure, not, it, it will create jobs. So you re reduce the need for unemployment benefit, but at the same time, you pay, you pay the foundation for the long-term growth. I think at the beginning, people were very reluctant, but I'm, see, I, I'm delighted to see now both the World Bank the IMF and uh, you know European Union and to some extent also the US accept the idea started to advocate the need for infrastructure. So recently the Biden administration proposed to the Congress for fund to support the infrastructure investment. So those kind of ideas when I was the World Bank, when I started to argue for that they were so foreign to many people. You know, they think, well, if infrastructure is an investment, market will take care, of, take care of that. But what we see, the market could not do it. And so we need to have an active government participation. And I'm delighted to see, you know, gradually, you know, people started to embrace uh, many ideas. I started to advocate, advocate at the World Bank and put into their programs. On the other hand, the US and Europe are continuing to deal with their huge debt crisis by uh, simply printing money, the quantitative easing sure. and other problems. So while they're acknowledging the, the huge deficit in infrastructure and they're making some small efforts in that direction, 
they're continuing with the QE, which is, is threatening a hyperinflation today, which I think even the inside gurus of Wall Street and the city of London are acknowledging that there's a grave, grave danger of a hyperinflation. What is your view on that? Yeah, I think that uh, you know, to change the ideas would be essential for changing their policy orientations. For this, I agree with Keynes. In the last sentence of his general theory, he said, it is ideas, not vested interests, which are dangerous for good or evil. And uh, in the past, you know, the world was influenced by those kind of you know, inappropriate neoliberalism. And so the government policy was shaped by those kind of misguided ideas. And so that's very important for your institute and for scholars like me to you know, advocate, present alternative ideas which can address the issue and also improve our well-being in individual country and also in the world. And I think that certainly at the end, people see the benefit and they will start to make some changes. At the beginning, maybe a very small step, but once they see the power of the right interventions, the power of the right policy, I'm hope, you know, I'm, I think that you know, you know, the world will, you know, only by the way the world will, will move for better. And I do wish the right idea will win the debate at the end. <clears throat> When I looked at your idea of wealth accounting going beyond the monetary figures of uh, GDP and, and debt, uh, I thought about uh, Lyndon LaRouche's idea of a non-monetary measure of economic progress, which he called relative potential population density. His view was that these were ratios determined by the transformation of the physical economies through the rates of development of new physical principles uh, right. discovered in nature and then applied to the productive process through new machine tools using those new yeah. principles. Do you see that as similar to your idea of wealth management? Wealth, I wealth think that, uh, Yeah, I think that that idea is very close to the idea that we just described or I have been advocating for a long time. And uh, we do see, you know, we share the same wisdom. And our, our ideas, our proposed converge on the same directions. Mm -hmm. And so we need to, you know, join hands to propose the right ideas, you know, through your institute and my institute and to orange it to more people. Good. You, you recently wrote an article with your associate, Dr. Yan Wang, who has yeah. also spoken at one of our, our uh, Schiller Institute conferences. Um, comparing the approach of the IMF and the World Bank to the development of Africa to that of the Chinese approach using your wealth accounting idea. Uh, and you said in that article that, um, that, the, uh, uh, that despite many decades of aid from the West, it did not address the infrastructure bottlenecks and that this was the primary reason that the African countries very much appreciate Chinese investment, which emphasizes infrastructure as the means to lift the productivity of the entire nation and escape from poverty. So as you know, the Schiller Institute and EIR have strongly promoted the idea of the new Silk Road since the 1990s actually, following, uh, following the fall of the Soviet Union and as a means of achieving peace through development. Uh, and of course, the Belt and Road Initiative launched by, uh, by President Xi Jinping is very much in that in the light. How, do you, how would you evaluate so far the progress of the Belt and Road Initiative in Africa and elsewhere? First, I'm delighted to see that this new ideas has been, you know, has been welcomed and also join hands <coughs> in the practice. For example, the Bear and Roll Initiative currently already 145 countries sign 
the strategic cooperation agreement with China. And also more than 30 international organizations signed you know, the strategic cooperation agreement with China. So I am delighted to see this idea has been widely accepted in the world. And, uh, and uh, China also continue to support the infrastructure and upgrading infrastructure improvement in the world in spite of the pandemic recessions. And uh, those kind of investments certainly provide the foundations to, you know, to for the future, but at the same time, improve the job and economic development even during these pandemic times. And I also like, I'm also delighted to see the European country now propose a similar you know, strategy like European gateway and mm -hmm. as a way to improve the infrastructure to link to other countries. So I think the world is moving towards the same directions, you know, and, and certainly the infrastructure gap is so huge. No one country can accomplish, you know, all what is needed. So it will be desirable to join hand and with all initiative by China, by European country, by Japan, by the US, because yeah. fundamentally we care about the humanity. We care about the, the future of the earth, the future of your human being. And as long as we contribute to that, we should join hands. And we should not uh, take the individual country in our political uh, 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 purpose and to that become a barrier for our corporations. Yes, in that same article about the African development, you, uh, you directly blamed the IMF and the World Bank for what you called neoliberal orthodoxy. And you said that the result of that was that many low and middle income countries continue to suffer from fundamental def deficiencies such as the lack of healthcare personnel and resources. And you even noted that 70 years of development aid and yet still, quote, there is the inability to deliver clean water, electricity, and sanitation. So as you know, the Schiller Institute president, Helga Zeplerusch, has formed a what she calls the Committee for the Coincidence of Opposites, which is based on an idea of the 15th century genius Nicholas of Cusa, uh, calling for a global mobilization to address the health crisis that you've identified, to provide a modern health system in every country, if the pandemic and future pandemics are, are going to be defeated. I know that part of what China has launched is a health silk road. So right. what are your thoughts on global cooperation to achieve this kind of health system in every country? I think that there's a need and a huge need there. And uh, this pandemic showed that. And uh, China certainly you know, contribute to that. You mentioned about health circle role. And you, you also understand China already provided two billion doses of vaccine to you know, Africa and other parts of the world. And uh, that is about, that's more than one third of the dose of vaccine you know, in the world and excluding China. So I think that, uh, that, but that's not needed. That's not sufficient. So we need to work harder to work together. Otherwise, you know, the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic may lingering. And as the longer you know, the pandemic is there, the harder to deal with because there are going to be you know, other new mutations coming out all the time make the vaccine becomes less effective. So we need to join hand to, to we need to join hand to contain it, the sooner the better. And we also need to accept the foundation to cope with similar uh, uh, challenges in the future. When this kind of threatening uh, 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 you know, violence appear at the beginning, we should, we should cope with that, we should you know, replace that immediately. And for that, we need to have global corporations. So I think the call uh, is very important and we should join hands to promote that. Good. 
Let me bring up the horrible situation in Afghanistan, um, where, as you know, 40 years of war and now the freezing of that nation's very scarce reserves by the US Federal Reserve and several European banks and the imposition of sanctions uh, and even cutting off the aid from the IMF and the World Bank, which has created uh, a threat of what has to be recognized as genocide through starvation and disease in that country. Um, in particular, the World Bank was supporting the nation's healthcare system for the last 20 years of the US NATO warfare and occupation there. And that's been completely cut off, leaving the country with virtually no public health system at all. Uh, and in this case, Helga Zepp LaRouche has launched another project. She calls it Project Ibn Sina, named after the 11th century uh, medical genius, uh, Persian, uh, who came from that region, though, of Afghanistan, and who, uh, and, and our, our proposal is demanding a release of these funds, not just emergency aid, but the release of these funds, but also to build the nation's infrastructure, as you've been emphasizing. Uh, by integrating Afghanistan into the Belt and Road, and in particular, extending the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the CPEC, uh, into Afghanistan. Do you think this is possible? I think it's possible. If we really care about humanity, I think that the support in the healthcare, in the medical situation, should be unconditional. And uh, you've accepted that ideas certainly well mean health and so on in Africa, in Afghanistan, and other developing countries will be improved. When uh, once they have the improvement in their health, improvement in the economic development, and then the social political stability there can be maintained. And I'm sure that it's not only go good for the individual country, it's also good for the global communities because then we will be in a better situation to work together and to have more corporations. And it will also reduce the you know, refugee legally and illegally to the high income country. Yeah. And you know, that will also be a big challenge for the high income country. So in some area, the support should be unconditional because that will to the humanity. If they really care about human beings, then no matter under what kind of situation, we should support some kind of those basic needs. Right. The, um, as you know, the, uh, the US and China signed a phase one agreement in January of 2020, uh, a trade agreement yep. between Trump administration and, and China. Uh, and at the White House, Liu He was there in attendance and President Xi Jinping was on the telephone with President Trump. And Trump at that time announced that he would soon make a second visit to China. Uh, and he said he looked forward to what he called in his words, continuing to forge a future of greater harmony, prosperity and commerce, which would lead to an ever, uh, even stronger world peace. Now, clearly this never happened. Uh, as the US failed to contain the COVID-19 pandemic, Trump eventually fell into adopting the antagonistic approach to China from his Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, blaming China for virtually every failure in the United States. And although the current Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, has the same hostile attitude towards China, uh, President uh, Biden has had uh, several long calls with President Xi. Uh, do you see some chance of restoring that, quote, greater harmony uh, coming out of this cooperation between Biden and President Xi? I think that China's story is always open. And as we said at the beginning, cooperation between China and the U.S. will pay the foundation to address many of the global challenges that we encounter today. So it will be essential. And China's door is open, you know. And, and, and but uh, why it did not occur? I think it's because certainly there are some problems in the US 
And uh, U.S., if you look into the past, U.S. always like to use other country as the uh, scapegoat for its own domestic problems. And uh, certainly that may gain some kind of political interest for the politician in the short run. But it will, put, it will make the issue become worse for the long term. So I hope the politicians and the intellectuals communities in the US will have the wisdom to understand what are the roots of its own problems. And it should not use the other country as the excuse or scapegoat for its own problems. The short term political gain is for a few politicians, but at a cost of the well-being of the whole nations. And I hope that this kind of situation will be improved. And uh, if those foundation, if you know, those kind of using other country as scapegoat for its own domestic problem is removed, then certainly US and China cooperation will be good for the US, for China, and for the world. I want to also bring up something that uh, Lyndon LaRouche very much focused on in his own work, which was that the quality of creativity, which distinguishes man from the beast, uh, is the same in scientific investigations as it is in artistic discoveries, especially that of classical music. Uh, and in that light that he insisted that scientific education and uh, aesthetic education must go hand in hand in order to allow the full development of the creative powers of our, of our youth and our population. Um, we have definitely taken, I personally have very much taken note of the fact that there is a new appreciation in China following the dark days of the Cultural Revolution to, uh, to honor the classical traditions in China of uh, Confucius and Mencius and the, the great minds of the Song Renaissance uh, dynasty, uh, people like Zhu Xi and Shen Guo, uh, and that this is going on simultaneous with the incredible uh, economic and scientific developments taking place in China, as well as China's increased uh, acknowledgement of the great cultural development in Western culture and Western classical music and so forth. So how, how do you see the relationship between economics and science and, and the aesthetic uh, side of, of, of cultural development? I, I see the science and art and, uh, and uh, they are complementary to each other's and they both enrich our human being. And, uh, and uh, an unleash of our potentials. And so we should not just focus on one thing and then neglect the others. And uh, uh, if we want to have a better society, and uh, we also want to have, uh, you know, uh, allow the people to, to develop them, you know, themselves with the greater potentials. And so as you describe and you notice, China now, you know, is trying to bring in our traditional cultural appreciation of the art, music, classic, not only from China, but from other civilization back to our programs, educational programs. So that's a good sign. And uh, I'm sure that we will further make the rejuvenation of China to reach a higher stage, not only materially, but culturally, spiritually. Well, okay, thank you. Um, is there any other, uh, other thoughts you'd like to convey to the, uh, to the, the Little Rouge organization uh, supporters? I, I'm delighted to have this opportunity and I hope our voice will be heard uh, in, in, in more corners in the world, and uh, because fundamentally we all care about human beings, and we all want to have a better society for you know every country in the world, 
And uh, so that's, you know, hope our message will get momentum, traction in the world. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your taking the time. I hope that we can, in fact, build on this cooperation. Uh, Helga Zepp LaRouche has always insisted that if we are going to bring about a new paradigm for mankind, it's going to mean that, that each culture reach back to its greatest moments and that we work together to bring about a truly human renaissance rather than just a, a, a European renaissance and a Chinese renaissance or an Islamic renaissance, but that we bring mankind together to address the common humanity that uh, is the one basis on which we can end this, this descent into conflict and war and depression. Very good, thank you very much. And thank you.